This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. The majestic Himalayas are home to the world's highest mountain. In 1957, an expedition set out to challenge this vast wilderness. Not to conquer Mount Everest, but to track down the elusive Yeti, a legendary human-like creature known in the West as the Abominable Snowman. Forty years ago, interracial romance in America was almost unheard of when John Elias and Eleanor Platt fell in love. An uncaring society forced them apart and coerced Eleanor into putting their baby up for adoption. In Florida, John and Virginia Constable left home to visit their daughter. Within two hours, they were dead, the innocent victims of an alleged drunk driver. Join me. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. March 1987. In Buffalo, New York, the coda to a poignant love story is played out. Eleanor Platt and John Elias are finally together again. They had fallen in love when they were young, but the ugly barrier of racial prejudice had kept them apart for 34 years. It was 1953. Brown versus the Board of Education had not yet been heard by the Supreme Court. A full six years after Jackie Robinson crossed baseball's color line, there were just 20 black players in the major leagues. Racial integration was an alien concept in most parts of the United States. Have you guys seen the new Kremlins in the window at Sample? Buffalo, New York was no exception. When high school student Eleanor Platt took an interest in John Elias, a black man 11 years her senior, it was by definition controversial and certain to bring trouble down on both of them. Have you seen him around? No. I think he is so cute. I think you're crazy. I do. I think he's older. He's looking at me. I'll be right back. Hi. Hi. This is for you. Thanks. What's your name? Eleanor. I'm John Elias. Eleanor Platt. Right away, I was drawn to him, and we started talking. We met at different places, and I just was fascinated with the feelings that we were having towards each other. And I knew that uh, I was in love with him. <laughs> what do you say? I don't know. Maybe Come on, you gotta break my heart. Maybe I should think about it. You gotta it. break my You gotta think about it. <laughs> Come here. We talked and talked, and we developed a closer, closer relationship. Okay, I will. And yeah. then I asked her, would she marry me? And she thought about it, and I asked her again. So finally, she decided after Christmas that she would leave home and that she would move in with me in my apartment. For Eleanor, leaving home was easier said than done. She knew her father would object violently. Nevertheless, on December 26, 1953, Eleanor ran away from her parents' home to begin a life with John Elias. I lived with John from the last part of December until the 26th of January. 
And on the 26th of January, I decided I was going back home because I s surmised that I was pregnant. At that point, she decided she wanted to tell her mother of her situation because she had been missing from home. I had warned her before that if she went home, that there would be problems. Eleanor! Daddy! Where you been, Eleanor? I've been staying with my friend John. John Elias. John Elias. You stay away from him. I really want you to meet him. I don't want to meet him. Then I really think you should. I said no! I'm going to have his baby. You what? Get out of my house now! No. Get out of here! No. My husband was an alcoholic, and he drank. And when he was drinking, he was not himself. And in order to keep peace in the family and keep my own sanity in one sense of the word, I had to play ball and, and let him take over and do what he wanted to do. I know what to do. I'll call Harry Horton at City Hall. Harry Horton, he'll take care of it, Eleanor. Don't take care of it. I don't want you to take care of it. She was put into a home because that's what they did with girls that made mistakes. And uh, the law took care of him because they accused him of, of rape. And so he was arrested for that. John Elias's arrest took place at midday in the factory where he worked. According to Eleanor, charges that John had held her against her will were trumped up. Because she was still three days shy of 18, John was charged with second-degree rape and given a nine-month jail sentence. I pleaded guilty to the grand jury uh, because I did not want to have Eleanor go through the ordeal of having to be in a trial and brought on the stand. In a way, I felt that I was protecting her. On September 13, 1954, in a home for unwed mothers, Eleanor gave birth to a daughter, Rose Marie. The authorities at the home had told Eleanor over and over that it might be best to give the baby up. When I had Rosemary, I really didn't want to give her up. I wanted to keep her. And in my own mind, I couldn't figure out any way of keeping her. And so it hurt deeply. Come on down, Eleanor. The day Eleanor had dreaded finally arrived. Rosemary was taken from her and placed in the temporary custody of social services until the situation could be evaluated. This is Eleanor and Rosemary. Eleanor's ready now. I handed my daughter to the social worker, and she took the baby and in turn handed her to the lady that was standing next to her. I was tore up inside because I knew that, or surmised that these ladies were going to take her and that I would never see her again. Eleanor immediately reestablished contact with John, who'd been released from jail early for good behavior. They were determined to get their daughter back. Once again, John proposed marriage. Eleanor eagerly accepted, but insisted that they tell her parents face to face. John, what are you doing here? You can't come in here. Well, we want your blessing. We want to get married. Joe, get out here right now. Look, we love each other. Why can't you understand? John, John. get out of my house. Daddy. Can't you see that we love each other? Sorry, you're married, Dad. huh? Yeah. There it is. Hey. 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 Ah. Come on. Don't come back, John. Come Don't come, come back. At this point, her parents had her arrested for failing to obey their lawful orders, even though she was over the age of 18. Eleanor disappeared. I had no idea of where she went. I could not contact her family because they didn't want me at their house. So after that, I asked around, asked around. No one knew where she went. Teddy, I don't want to do this. You sign it. Baby, listen to Daddy. No, what Eleanor had been sentenced to a three-year term in a juvenile detention facility. However, she was told that her sentence would be reduced if, and only if, she put Rose Marie up for adoption. I was naive, and I did not know how the laws were, and 
I was as scared of my parents. I was as scared of the social worker. And so I went ahead and signed the papers, not knowing what the consequences would be in the long run. Well, Eleanor, I understand you've come to a final decision regarding adoption. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Good, because I think it's in the very best interest of your baby daughter. Now, if you'll sign these papers right here, and as soon as you do now, this... I was wondering if we could if we could wait one more week. Absolutely not. Now, we've discussed this over and over again, Eleanor. The longer you take, the harder it's going to be on the baby, on yourself, on your parents, on everyone concerned. Afterwards, I found out that if I had read and understood the law more, that I would not have had to give her up because I was 18 years of age. I hope that someday you'll realize what a good decision you made. When I did the signing, I felt all tore up inside, like I'd, I'd signed my life away. And there was nothing I could do. Eleanor was released six months after she signed the adoption papers. I still wanted to see John and, and get together with John and marry John because I loved him. John was nowhere to be found. Only later did she discover that he had literally been run out of town. I was continually harassed by the police department. When I was driving my car, they would ask me for my license, my registration, my license, my registration, a continual harassment type thing. I did not see Eleanor anymore after that because I left town where I could get a decent job and start settling down after that ordeal. Eleanor would never have another child. Because of complications resulting from Rosemary's birth, Eleanor was forced to undergo a hysterectomy at the age of 22. Eventually, the pain of her shattered youth subsided. In 1977, Eleanor married Stephen Wozniak, and together they raised four foster children. John Elias was married also. He and his wife had two children, a boy and a girl. In 1987, John began to search in earnest for his lost daughter, Rose Marie. Along the way, he located Eleanor. Is that really you? Yes, it's me. It's a long time since I've seen you, kid. I know it. It's good to see you. Oh, come on in the house. It's sure. too cold out Why here. Not? Here. Sure thing. With the blessing of both of their spouses, John and Eleanor resolved to find their daughter. If my daughter is watching this show, Rosemary, I want you to know that I do love you and your father loves you, and that's why we're working together to find you. There's so much we want to explain to you and to tell you that we really do care, and we really did care at the time. I hope that we will be successful in finding this child who's been gone for all of these years, who was literally uh, taken away from us by the forces of the law. And at that point, even though we don't want to interfere with her life, we'd just like to know her whereabouts, how she is, and how she came out. John and Eleanor's search came to an end the night of our broadcast when a viewer in Elmira, Pennsylvania, recognized their long-lost daughter as one of his co-workers, Sally Riley. One of my co-workers called me on the phone, and he's hysterical, and he's going, were you watching Unsolved Mysteries? And I said, no. And he said, you're not going to believe this. And I said, what do you mean I'm not going to believe this? He said, they're looking for you. And I said, what do you mean they're looking for me? He says, your mother and father were on TV looking for you. Two weeks later, Sally and her fiancé traveled to New York and introduced her children to Eleanor and John for the first time. When I first saw my parents, I was it, I was kind of flabbergasted or in awe. I really don't know the word I'm looking for, but it just, I, you had to stare at them because, you know, it's like I'm a part of them. Unless a person has gone through it, there is no way to describe the feeling that uh, a person has once they find their child that's been adopted. I had carried an imaginary picture in my mind of how I thought she would look. All I needed, I had uh, a 
form, but I didn't have a face. When she stepped out of the vehicle, I had a face, and it was a good feeling. The very special reunion was arranged by Dominic Telesco, director of the Center for Reuniting Families. John was just in awe, looking out the window at his daughter that they had never seen. He had never seen her. So it was a very, very happy reunion, very touching, very emotional. It wasn't complete all the years. Anyway. Yeah, we got For John, Sally, and Eleanor, the reunion marked the beginning of an emotional healing process that was long overdue. No, I don't have, well, that's up to you guys to do that. You know, I want to make it as much as possible as a mother-daughter situation. <laughs> and I want to try to make up for some of the years that I have missed in the same way with the grandkids. With their growing up to be teenagers, I want, I've missed a lot of that, and I like to share what I have left with them. <laughs> I'm just glad I have a very extended family now and that everybody is accepting me and I'm accepting them, and it just it feels really good. Next, authorities need your help to capture an accused drunk driver. March 3rd, 1991, just outside Kissimmee, Florida. Local authorities converge on the scene of a deadly highway accident. It is a tragedy played out every day all over the country. A drunk driver has lost control of his vehicle and claimed innocent victims. In this case, an elderly couple, 71-year-old John Constable and his wife, Virginia, age 69. They had been married for 45 years. It is a tragic fact that 22,000 Americans are killed by drunk drivers every year. It is a bitter reality that many of those who drive while intoxicated survive the terrible accidents they cause. All too often, the victims become faceless statistics, except for the people who lost someone they love. I've been out of here 15 minutes. Did you pack the proof? Yes, I have the proof. I have everything packed. Did you get the camera? Yes, let's just get these okay. things in the car. On Sunday, March 3, 1991, John and Virginia Constable left Davenport, Florida to visit their daughter Linda in Jacksonville, a three-hour drive away. Did you call Linda? I called her. I talked to her just before we left. She's all excited, waiting for us to get there. At 12.35 p.m., the constables were still just a few miles from their home, heading north on County Road 545, which they traveled nearly every day. Just ahead, traveling southbound and approaching a sharp curve was a pickup truck driven by James White, a house painter and handyman. No one knows what time he started drinking or how much he consumed. At 12.43 p.m., eight minutes after the accident, the highway patrol and rescue teams had rushed to the area. John Constable had died at the incident of impact. His wife, Virginia, was suffering from massive internal injuries. As she was being evacuated, Trooper Eugene Brewer of the Florida Highway Patrol arrived at the scene. I directed my attention to Mr. White, who was the single occupant in the pickup truck and he was placed in the ambulance, and I got in the back of the ambulance with him, at which time I could smell the odor of alcoholic beverage. I'm Trooper Brewer, Florida Highway Patrol, okay? I'm gonna request the paramedic take a blood sample from you. The results of the blood test would later reveal that James White had a blood alcohol level of 0.22, more than twice Florida's legal limit of 0.10. White was taken to Kissimmee Memorial Hospital, 12 miles away. Mrs. Constable was medevaced to a trauma center in Orlando. 
Nearly every organ in her body had been ruptured. She died just over an hour later at 2.06 p.m. It got to be 4.30, 5 o'clock. So finally, I called the Florida Highway Patrol. I was getting very concerned about them being so late. And then the Florida Highway Patrol officer pulled in our driveway. And I didn't think anything of it because we had placed a call. And he probably wanted some information to find them. Thank you for answering our call so soon. It's all right. Unfortunately, I'm here to advise you that Mr. and Mrs. Constable were involved in a serious accident earlier this afternoon. Are they all right? No, ma'am. He afraid. said that there had been an automobile accident and there was a fatality. Are you sure? Yes, sir, I'm sure. I just remember asking which one. I never dreamed it would have been both of them. And after that, I don't remember anything. It's a common thing in our profession to investigate accidents with DUIs involved, and uh, more so than not, we find a lot of them where the innocent people are killed and the, and the people that have been drinking survive. Hey, Jimmy, how you doing, bud? James White had suffered a fractured jaw, a broken ankle, and three broken ribs. His jaw was wired shut, and he was admitted to the intensive care unit. His relatives, who lived in the area, became a constant presence at the hospital. He's in a lot of pain. By Wednesday night, three days after the accident, White's condition had improved considerably. Hey, where are y'all going? Uh, just out for a walk. Okay, visiting hours are over. If you can have him back in 30 minutes, no problem. Okay, thanks. His family apparently was walking him a little bit each day, and the third day, apparently, they kept right on walking. It is believed that James White and some of his relatives left the hospital by an unguarded rear door. They have not been seen since. Only later did the authorities discover that White had a long history of drunk driving arrests. There was only one real clue to go on, a driver's license issued to White in North Carolina. Local authorities in North Carolina were sent to the address shown on his license, and no, no person by that name was living there and hadn't lived there. So uh, I don't know if he was just using that as an address to get a driver's license or or what. He is an habitual offender. He has done this before, and he has a long arrest record just here in the state of Florida. And. He just has no remorse for the human life. I just continuously go over their accident every day. It's just something that never leaves me. Trying to imagine what they had gone through. Update, Burlington, Vermont. James White has been arrested. Following the broadcast of Unsolved Mystery, we received some 200 phone calls about James White and his whereabouts. Two days after the Unsolved Mysteries broadcast, we got the phone call we were waiting on. James White was spotted by someone who had seen the program up in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, he was seen in a bar, and he was arrested and taken into custody up there. I was very glad to get him off the road, to think that he's not going to kill someone else. I think it's a terrible thing what he did. Yeah. He should have stayed there, and he should have faced the music. Two weeks after he was captured, James White was returned to Florida, where he is scheduled to stand trial on all charges. White, who has two prior convictions for drunk driving, could receive a maximum sentence of 30 years in prison. Next, the search for the Yeti, a mysterious half-man, half-ape, said to live in the remote Himalayas.
The Himalayas extend through southern Asia, forming an almost impassable barrier between China and India. It is a vast windswept land, site of the world's highest mountain, and one of its most enduring mysteries. For centuries, the Sherpa people who are native to the Himalayas have told frightening tales of a strange half-man, half-ape called the Yeti. One of the first people to come across is an Englishman, and he talked to the Sherpas, and they said it has a very bad smell. It has a powerful odor. And he said, um, he described it later, later as an abominable odor. And when this went through the channels and eventually got into the English newspapers, it became the abominably smelling man. And so the smelling part was dropped. It became the abominable man and eventually the abominable snowman. That's how the name came about. Mr. Doctor, believe now, the Yeti, Yeti go up there. The abominable snowman, the perfect Hollywood villain. He was monstrous, almost comical, and impossible to take seriously. It is difficult to imagine that a creature like the abominable snowman actually exists. Most of us dismiss him as a fanciful legend. But for the native shippers of the Himalayas, the Yeti is very real and very much alive. Their belief is shared by a number of Western explorers, most of whom have never seen a Yeti, but remain convinced that such animals do roam the high plateaus of the Asian wilderness. In the 1920s, Western man began descending upon the Himalayas. Over the next 30 years, numerous expeditions were launched in the hopes of conquering Mount Everest at 29,000 feet, the world's highest peak. With each expedition came more stories of strange human-like creatures who lived in the mountains. Then in 1951, world-renowned mountaineer Eric Shipton came across a curious set of tracks, the first clear evidence that the Yeti might, in fact, be real. The photograph of the Shipton footprint is very uh, big piece of evidence because it showed toes, individual toes. It showed a squat, square footprint, which a lot of the other expeditions had found, but not had good photographic equipment with them. The footprint photographed by Shipton was 13 inches long and 8 inches wide. Shipton was certain it was not made by a man or an ape. His discovery sparked renewed interest in finding a Yeti. In 1957, a millionaire Texas oil man named Tom Slick and a colorful explorer named Peter Byrne set off for the Arun Valley in northeastern Nepal, a rugged, hostile region where temperatures often fall below zero. Tom Slick believed uh, that there were a lot of uh, interesting biomedical problems that needed to be solved. He felt if he could find a missing link, that would unlock some of the mysteries of uh, medicine for humans. So he really began looking uh, because he thought it was a hybrid animal, something in between apes and man, the missing link. Uh, Tom Slick's um, interest in the beginning was to find out uh, if the Yeti were really there. And uh, that's the reason he came on the first reconnaissance. I had been hearing about the Yeti for years, ever since I was a child. But I think that what eventually convinced me that they were there was meeting with the Sherpas and talking with them face to face. Namaste. Namaste. The Sherpas uh, viewed the Yeti as a real living creature, uh, not as a mythical creature. And they called him a hairy man that lived out there separate from them. On the first expeditions, we took along with us eight by 10 pictures of a chimpanzee, a gorilla, a primitive man, and so on. Yo, Yeti chan. Yo, Yeti chan. Ah, Oina. Does he understand what we want here? And they used to point to the primitive man and say, that's the Yeti. They, in fact, they thought we had a picture of the Yeti when they saw that. Definitely. Yes, I see. Are you sure? The Sherpas described the Yeti to us always as um, being uh, man-like in form, um, about five foot six, five foot seven, five foot eight, not, not very large, and um, covered with hair, totally covered with hair, walking upright. Uh, the face was bare of hair, the palms of the hands, that sort of thing. By the third week of the expedition, Slick and Byrne decided to split up to cover a wider search area. 
Each was to make his own startling discovery. Our main find on that first reconnaissance was two sets of footprints. The set of footprints that I found, we'd started out um, from our camp in the early morning, and we simply chose a mountain, and I came across a line of footprints. I'll say, what is that? It's not bear. There's no claws. Well, what is it then? Baka Yeti. You're sure? Yeti. Baka Yeti, Mr. Peter. It's Yeti. In Peter Burns' photograph, the alleged Yeti footprint is on the left. It dwarfs the boot print of one of the expedition members seen on the right. Stop, Tom! Stop, Tom! What is it? Eti, Eti! In another part of the Eti, valley, Eti, at an elevation of 12,000 feet, Tom Slick and his Eti. Sherpa guys discovered a similar set of tracks. Eti. The significance of the, of the prints that Tom Slick found uh, is that they were in mud, and um, whereas snow will distort with heat and with wind and so on, um, mud will not. He only saw two or three, because it's very hard to track in that stuff. In fact, he was lucky to find them. A plaster cast was struck and shipped to the United States to be analyzed. The footprint measured 10 inches long and 7 inches wide. It had some of the same characteristics of the footprint discovered by Eric Shipton six years earlier. It was a short, squat, almost square type of footprint. And I sent it to the various uh, physical anthropology experts uh, around the country. And what they usually, the terminology came back was unique, but we don't know what it is. The discovery of the footprints made headlines around the world. Slick and Byrne began preparing a second expedition determined not only to see a Yeti, but to capture one. In February of 1958, Peter Byrne returned to the Himalayas to embark on an exhausting four-month trek. Tom Slick financed the operation, but remained behind. Three months into the expedition, Byrne hit the jackpot. He met a Buddhist monk who had a remarkable story to tell. You've been looking for a Yeti. He likes scotch, this, this old man. And uh, one evening, while we were sitting there, having a drink and talking, he, um, he said to me, he whispered, he said, you know, that up in the uh, temple, we have a hand. Hand? A what? Yeti hand. And he said, would you like to see it? And I said, yes. So we went back up to the temple. We went into the top part of the temple, and he showed me this hand, about the size of a human hand, cut off at the wrist. Uh, I considered it very significant, and I took some pictures of it immediately, some flash pictures. I asked the Lama, of course, um, could I have it? And he said, no. He said, it must never leave the temple here. If it leaves the temple, various calamities will befall the temple and the community and so on. I asked him if I could have a part of it, and he said no. Burns' photograph caused an uproar among the members of Tom Slick's scientific team. The alleged Yeti hand was unlike anything they had seen before. Opinion was divided. Was it human? Was it ape? Or was it an entirely new species? The fall of 1958 found Peter Byrne back in London. He and Tom Slick met with members of the scientific community to discuss the latest findings. We were having lunch, um, Tom Slick, myself, um, Dr. Osmond Hill, and uh, the subject of the hand came up. And a nail. Mind you, it wasn't a claw. Mm. Uh, Dr. Hill said, you've got to get the hand. Do you think you could get to see the Yeti hand again? Alone, I mean. <clears throat> well, yes, I'm quite sure I could. You know, I had thought. Hill, who was a brilliant scientist, reached under the table and he pulled out um, a brown paper sack. And he said, there you are. <laughs> I take it that's not dessert, Doctor. Very yeah, funny. <laughs> <laughs> no. My point is, we could replace the Yeti hand with this human one. What do you think? Well, 
I'm not quite so sure I could replace the entire hand. But maybe a finger. By the next year, Peter Byrne had returned to the Himalayas to carry out the plan. He gained access to the monastery by inviting the monk to partake of another bottle of fine scotch. I cut the finger off and I replaced it with the human finger. It took quite a long time to wire the whole thing together and um, put it all back together and put it back in the box. And um, nobody ever knew anything about it. And everything, everybody actually was perfectly happy. They still had their hand, it still had its fingers. The thumb was brought back to London, where it became the focus of a detailed examination. It was sent to me, and I sent it to some of the 20 experts, which I thought should look at the hand. And they were about equally divided, whether it was human or whether it was some type of primate, known or unknown. Dr. Agogino placed a tissue sample in an envelope and tucked it away in his desk, where it remained for more than 30 years. In 1960, television personality Marlon Perkins and Sir Edmund Hillary, the conqueror of Mount Everest, launched a Yeti search of their own. They came back convinced that there was no such animal as the Yeti. And um, even the descriptions of the Yetis can be explained by um, uh, perfectly ordinary means. They were essentially over there to debunk it. Most of the members of the, the Hillary expedition didn't believe in Yeti to start with, so they went over there and they found bear skin, said that was Yeti, and then they debunked it. They looked at the Pan Boucher hand, said, wow, this has got wires on it. You know, and the, obviously it had wires on it because the Tom Slick expedition had uh, taken parts of it and wired it up again. So everything they came across, the Hillary expedition, they said, there is no Yeti. So. You know, none of us were surprised when they came back and said, Yeti doesn't exist. Interest in the Yeti began to wane. Then on October 6, 1962, Tom Slick died in a plane crash. His partners subsequently abandoned the hunt for the elusive Yeti, but the sightings continued. I had made camp at 16,500 feet when out of the darkness, a very loud piercing call began that sounded like nothing I'd ever heard before. It moved around, it circled our campsite, it would get closer, it would get farther away, it would call intermittently, and the call was always very loud and very piercing and very frightening. I was on a distance of 10 meters, so it was my impression, it's bigger than me, it was quite hairy and strong with uh, short legs, and the face was a little bit more um, white or clear than the, the body. The body was quite dark. Dark brown, black hairs, long, long hairs. And he has a, quite a, a lot of hairs on the, on, the, on, the, on the head. I have to leave it open that I do not know what the abominable snowman is, but I feel there is a very good chance, probably 50-50, that something resembling the thing they're looking for does exist. During the course of filming the story, Unsolved Mysteries learned of the piece of tissue Dr. Agogino had set aside 30 years ago. The sample was analyzed at the University of California's Molecular Evolution Lab. The results were inconclusive, but seemed to indicate that the tissue probably came from a human hand. The problem with something as vague as the Yeti is that almost any result you have can be fitted into the uh, into the theory. So I'm sure that most believers will say, well, this is great. This proves that the Yeti is some sort of subhuman species. I think that's what we've always thought, uh, that it wasn't an animal, that it wasn't an upright walking ape, because apes don't walk upright anyway, um, that it was um, a hominid, a hominid form, a human form of some kind. Do the Himalayas conceal one of the great mysteries of the 20th century? providing a safe and isolated haven for a distant relative of man? Or is the Yeti simply a fanciful myth, the creation of a primitive people and an imaginative group of explorers? It seems impossible that in this day and age, we might discover an entirely new species of animal. However, we must remember it was only 70 years ago that the giant panda of China was first observed in the wild by Western man. 
Until then, it too was regarded as nothing more than a mythological creature. Next, the ashes of an unknown woman are discovered on an isolated California island. All of us have known people who live their lives outside the mainstream, adhering to their own rules, marching to the beat of a different drummer. In life, we find their eccentricities fascinating. But often when a deeply private person dies, he leaves behind an unsolved mystery. Dr. Kerry Stanton, who died in 1987, was just such a man. Stanton, a lifelong bachelor, was a scion of a wealthy California family. He graduated from medical school at Stanford University, then practiced as a pathologist in New York City. In 1957, when he was just 34 years old, Dr. Stanton left New York. He returned to California to run the family cattle ranch. It was not a typical ranch. Stanton's family owned nine-tenths of Santa Cruz Island, at 62,000 acres, the largest of California's Channel Islands. When Dr. Stanton's parents died, he took control of the ranch. Kerry Stanton was very protective of Santa Cruz Island. He used to say that this island was not his, it was just a responsibility that was handed down to him from his parents. Dr. Stanton lived in virtual solitude in the main ranch house, though he welcomed house guests. Did you have a nice day with us? Yeah, sure. Yes. You know, the vaquero's coming tomorrow at 5 in the morning to pick up cattle. Perhaps you could help me with that. I could really use your help. Oh, that'd be fine. Oh, yes. That'd be great. Almost time to... We'd love to get up and... As the years passed, Stanton developed a rigid, sometimes quirky schedule, which he expected all visitors to abide by. Dinner was always a semi-formal affair, which began precisely at 7.30 p.m. The weekly menu never varied. The same five main courses were rotated in sequence throughout the year. For the last 20 years. At the stroke of 8.30, Dr. Stanton and his guests repaired to the living room for coffee and the only dessert ever served, oatmeal cookies. Dr. Stanton retired for the evening at precisely 9 p.m. During all the years he lived on the island, he rarely deviated from his routine. Hmm. Thank you for a very nice evening. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good night. For Dr. Kerry Stanton, Santa Cruz Island was heaven on earth. He established a private cemetery exclusively for those who had been intimately associated with the island. Stanton even had his parents' bodies exhumed cremated and reburied in the little cemetery. By 1987, there were 14 graves surrounding the ranch chapel. On December 8th of that year, a total rose to 15. Dr. Kerry Stanton was dead at the age of 64. Dr. Stanton left the entire ranch to the Nature Conservancy. The Conservancy, in conjunction with Santa Barbara County's Agricultural Commission and other environmental agencies, worked to preserve the island in its pristine state. Marla, come on over for a second. On April 27, 1990, the Deputy Agricultural Commissioner discovered an old metal box in a shed on the ranch. Take a look at this. What do you think? And I looked in the box, and it was full of ashes. And I recognized the ashes as being those of a human, human remains. Now let's pour these out and see what we can find. No one on the island knew anything about the mysterious ashes. Larry Gillespie, the Santa Barbara County coroner, found a few intriguing clues. A snap-like clothing fastener manufactured in the 1940s, several false teeth from the 50s, and a diamond-studded platinum ring dating from before World War II. Snap. Later, tests on the bone fragments would yield more information. We believe that it's an elderly female victim based upon the findings of the arthritic changes of the bones and the characteristic of that one particular wrist bone that uh, appeared to be female. Was Dr. Kerry Stanton the keeper of a deep, dark secret? It seems unlikely. 
Stanton had a reputation as a compulsive archivist who meticulously labeled everything. It is very unlike Kerry Stanton to have the loose end, in particular, of human remains left on Santa Cruz Island. It's not something that he would do. Who is a mystery woman of Santa Cruz Island? All that is known is that she died sometime after World War II at an age past 50. She suffered from a slight arthritic condition and wore a platinum and diamond eternity ring. The Santa Cruz Island Foundation doesn't know what to do with her, and we very much would like to do the right thing and find a place where she belongs. And if it's on the island, we would like to see that she's added to the cemetery if she belongs here. We want to do the right thing to make sure that these ashes receive a final resting place, which is appropriate. Next week marks a very special milestone for Unsolved Mysteries, the broadcast of our 100th episode. In an unprecedented two-hour show, you'll see a fascinating array of intriguing mysteries and recent updates. Join me next Wednesday for this memorable celebration, the 100th episode of Unsolved Mysteries. Thank you.